What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Super Men's Comics, and we are back again to give you those comic book market trends for this week. That's right. This is the three up, three down. We're giving you three hot and three cold market trends within the comic community, and we're not holding back. We're going to get into it right now, starting with that first uptrend, and we are talking about Fortnite. Everyone, especially if you have a kid, knows Fortnite, that video game, knows those crazy dances, knows those avatars, knows everything about it, but now we are getting Marvel Comics with Fortnite as well. That's right. My kids have been playing Fortnite over the last couple of months. Uh, going through the pandemic, I have two daughters, um, and they have been playing Fortnite nonstop. And with the latest season, the whole Marvel Comics uh, inclusion has gotten them very excited. And it's funny, because I try so hard to get my kids excited about what's going on with comic book publishing. And a lot of times as a parent, you feel like you're, you know, you're talking on deaf ears. But here, Fortnite does it, and suddenly, my kid is telling me about Thor and Galactus. And the next thing I know, I'm like, wait, what are, what are, you, what are you looking at? Um, and to see this original comic story play out, uh, throughout the Fortnite game, which the story is actually um, written by Donny Cates uh, with art by Greg Horn is amazing. Uh, and it this is really cool and it, it's happening on multiple levels. Now, there's a lot of negative talk about this on Twitter, right? People have been giving Donny, Donny Cates a hard time uh, about this. And he makes a good point that like, people loved Marvel versus Capcom. And this is just the new generation's version of that. When it's easy for those of us who grew up on like the Capcom fighting games to sit there and, and judge something like this. But this go, kind of goes on something that Brian and I have been, I don't want to say preaching about, but I'll say talking about for a number of years, which is respecting fandoms. And the fact that being parents, Brian of two young boys and me of two young girls at, of the exact same ages, uh, gives us a very unique perspective. And we're going to see variants rolling out. They just hit FOC this week. Um, on basically every Marvel title featuring various uh, Fortnite characters. But the big news is Fantastic Four 24 is going to have a backup story written by Donny Cates with that uh, Greg Horn art. That story that you have seen play out in the video game will be in print as a backup story of Fantastic Four 24. It is canon to Donny Cates' Thor run. And I think that Fantastic Four 24 is going to be a sleeper because of it. Yeah, you understand. I mean, you say a lot of people get upset about it, and I can understand why people get upset about it. But through the years and through the collecting, we've also talked about this on the channel. It's getting those stories in front of a different audience, that young audience that's not you that might not be used to comics, that might not be used to Thor, and that might bring new readers into the hobby. So I want to talk about a bubble bursting. Well, yeah, the bubble might burst, or the comic collecting might decline if you're not bringing new readers into it and there's Absolutely. no better way to do so than that crossover especially with one of those most popular games and one of the most popular comic book writers right now i'm all about it i can't wait to read the story myself but the next one we're talking about on the three up portion we got a bunch of del auto disney exclusive variants going around recently we've had that mickey mouse we've had that goofy the thing is it's not new art either no, no, this is a number of years old. Now, you if you think about it, there we've seen the aesthetic of these Del Auto Disney variants throughout a number of retailer store exclusive variants because there was a period that um, I, I've dubbed the Del Auto Black period where he did these kind of uh, uh, paintings on a black canvas where you've seen them in Amazing Spider-Man. There have been a number of those covers. You've seen them in Venom. Um, you've seen them in uh, Immortal Hulk. Uh, you've seen them uh, in a number of, of different properties and titles. And he did a lot of these. And I don't know if it was commission work or if it was just kind of a sketch thing, uh, a process he was doing. But they've been on, available online. Um, when we started our retailer exclusive variant company, one of the things we did was do some research on what art is out there. And one of the first things we actually found were these Del Auto pieces, but we were told how difficult it was to acquire Del Auto art that people already kind of had their, uh, you know, their hooks in there. And sure enough, Scorpion Comics been releasing these um, these Del Auto variants. The first one was on uh, 
Disney comics and stories. I believe it was number 13. And that was that original uh, Mickey Mouse one. And then the, the last one that just got released, that was a reprint of Disney comics and stories number one. Um, so I think we're going to see more of like the reprint move as Disney comics and stories really comes out very infrequently slow. Um, so if, if the retailer wants to capitalize and there is a few more pieces, there is a, there's a dark wing duck. There is a, uh, another goofy, um, there is a Scrooge McDuck. And, um, I expect with the success and the secondary market success. And if you're not familiar, we're talking multiple hundreds of dollars on these on the, on the secondary market, um, and instant sellouts when they release them online. Um, and I think it, we can only expect to see more of these get released from Scorpion Comics. So um, they are amazing. Uh, it, you know, they are old art, so it's maybe it doesn't have the same luster. I would love to see Delato do something new and fresh, but at the same point, uh, it's great to see a big name doing a property like Disney. Yeah, something as small as Disney too. <laughs> but the last one we're going to talk about on the three-up portion this has moved over to Netflix from that YouTube Red. It's a great show, and the comics are seeing some heat from it as well. We are talking about Cobra Kai. Yeah, so Cobra Kai is the most watched television show ever. Um, when it was on YouTube, the numbers were staggering. Uh, and it, they were almost unbelievable when YouTube would report what, what the total um, uh, viewing total like worldwide for, uh, for um, Cobra Kai was. And then fast forward to them doing the deal with Netflix and then getting on Netflix. Netflix is now reporting astronomical numbers um, uh, on the reruns of the first two seasons that were available on YouTube Red. They're doing just incredible, incredible numbers. And this is definitely being uh, seen in the, in the comic book market. So that you can point to certain issues. There are some advertisements. Um, there's some things going around on Instagram about Transformers 60 and advertisement. But the truth is, there was never a Karate Kid comic before. So this Cobra Kai series that IDW put out uh, a couple of years ago or last year, it, this four issue mini series, it's really, it's the first appearance of uh, Danny LaRusso, um, you know, of all of these characters. And you're seeing this reflected in the secondary market. It's funny because a lot of these like TV show movie property books, um, they don't ever really penetrate the secondary market. And something has to get to like a really iconic level where there has to be a real comic book tie-in with whether it's the actors or the personalities. Um, we're starting to see it with John Wick, where John Wick comics are starting to get seriously uh, collected on the secondary market. And, we're, and I think we're starting to see that now with Cobra Kai. So last week, I almost put Cobra Kai on the list because it was moving a lot of copies. But books were still going for cover price. Now we're starting to see uh, issue number one creep up towards the $20 range. We're starting to see issues two through four uh, creep above cover price and we're starting to see those incentives push beyond fifty dollars into the the sixty seventy five hundred dollar range for these one in ten incentives which are truly truly ghosts uh for many of them and that uh one in twenty five incentive for issue number one is extremely extremely tough so I, this is going to be a series i think is going to continue to have popularity and it's one that i would check for because I, i've been able to find some over the last couple of weeks at cover price here and there and then you never find a store that has a lot but you can find some places that'll have you know one or two um and it's one of those things to kind of keep an eye out for i would be grabbing it because it, netflix is a beast and, and when pop culture grabs a hold of something it's uncontrollable yeah i would pick it up if i see it at my lcs or something like that but i would not buy eBay prices right now because it's at the right. height of the popularity with the Netflix. And anyone that knows me and knows me on this channel is I'm driven by nostalgia and there's nothing more nostalgic than the 80s of Karate Kid. And that series is fun. I got my kids watching it. And the second season is even better. I'm a big fan of the show Kingdom that was on DirecTV that's now on Netflix as well. There's a guy that plays a character in that show that plays a hardware store clerk in the second season and he makes the second season for me from cobra kai but hey, Nat, do, do you know why brian they never did a karate kid comic for the original movies why because the karate kid is actually a dc licensed character and in order to make the movie dc comics uh gave permission to the character for dc comics though karate kid if you look up those comics is completely different from the 70s they gave permission uh to the filmmakers to use 
the rights to the name Karate Kid for the film, but obviously they didn't have the comic book rights because DC Comics retained them. So the comics were never made, and therefore Cobra Kai from IDW ends up becoming the first Karate Kid comic series. And you know what? Knowing is half the battle. <laughs> So we're going to shift over to the down right now. These are the downward trends, but sometimes still provide buying opportunities. And I think there's buying opportunities in this first one. But right now, we talked highly about DC Black Label, but it does seem to be down. It doesn't have that attention that it was getting before. Yeah, and I really don't have a good reason for this. Um, it just it seems to be that the releases aren't commanding the immediate heat. This was something I was thinking about as I was putting together the bolo list. As I really started looking at books that I was excited about the last couple of weeks, that really the market didn't pay the same level of interest to. Um, we get like uh, Joker and Harley Criminal Insanity number five this week. That's a series that I've been heavily interested in. Uh, definitely. Uh, kind of hurt by delays and I think that has a lot to do with it but also the new Tom Taylor Hellblazer series that came out like I think a week ago amazing read amazing first issue which is kind of what I'm getting to the point that I expect from Tom Taylor I really think he's an A-list writer at this point um, and if you're not reading like basically everything Tom Taylor drops I definitely think if you see his name get thrown on a title it's worth paying attention to um, great first issue uh, better than average Hellblazer book I felt like so um, I still feel like DC Black Label is giving me what I'm looking for from these DC comic stories, a little bit darker, a little bit edgier, a little bit more adult uh, and, uh, you know, less pandering to the quote unquote superhero trope. But, um, at, you know, the market has not gotten on board with a Black Label book in a while. I think they view it all as Elseworld stories, right? And we talked about before when Vertigo label, the Vertigo imprint went away, that basically it went away, but it didn't want to go away because we just saw DC Black yeah. label basically being the same thing for it. A lot of great stories in there. Um, of course, a lot of those books were those prestige format or those wider books people sometimes have an issue with, which I did at first, but once I noticed they were printing more that way, I didn't feel as bad because you know you can – buy the storage for it and then you're doing yeah. it for multiple books not just one book going <laughs> what am i gonna do with this book so but the next one we're talking about that three down is all ages imprints i guess some people could say that it's always been down but we've seen that's not always the case as well right well all ages imprints i i think that we're going to get people um commenting on this just from viewing the graphic because this week, there were several new all ages imprints announced. So I think that the market uh, as a whole, not including now, when I say the market, I don't mean our secondary market readers. Um, I know you speculators and all that could give two shits about all ages imprints. Unless um, it's got like a Harley Quinn Scooby crossover, then they're selling it for 20 bucks. Right, right. So I totally, um, I totally get it. Um, uh, that's not what I mean. When I say the market probably would say all ages and prints are up is the fact that like the best selling comic books, if, if you, you include graphic novels over the last several years have been all ages books. And I think that that has created a rush to create all ages imprints. The problem is, is kind of what we just talked about, about segments of the comic market. The second you label a book part of an all ages imprint, it loses a lot of its value in kind of the, the marketplace because there's a certain customer base that's just not going to buy an all ages book because all ages to them is just a pseudonym for kids. So while you and I have had this conversation before, all ages means all ages. It means it's for me and it's for my kid. It's the same way we enjoy um, Marvel movies. Marvel movies largely are all ages experiences. Um, and that's what we try to tell people about, let's say, like the IDW Marvel stuff or the IDW Star Wars stuff. It's not dumbed down. It just may, it doesn't go places that some of the Marvel publishing places go, i.e., um, you know, violence and death and sex and drugs. And you're not going to see any of that stuff in those books. But it's still the same superhero stories dealing with the same levels of, of danger and um, with the same things at stake. And at the same point, though, when you're trying to sell these books, again, once they get labeled as just kids books, you're eliminating an entire portion of the customer base, which the reason why it's important that we talk about this is we always say, what's, what's the lifeblood of our business, right? It's the LCS. 
Well, the LCS isn't really catering to the all ages market. The, the, the majority of their customers are traditional comic buyers. So they're not putting like heavy shelf space, heavy storage space to all ages and prints. Now imagine if Canto had come out and had been labeled as part of IDW's all ages and print. Would we have talked about it the way we've talked about it the last couple of years? Would it have gotten the attention that it deserves? Think about Wind right now for Boom Studios, which now just hit a third print for number one. Really kind of snuck up on people as the story progressed. People started to really get into it. And now we're talking about Wind for adaptation for either movie or TV. Um, if it was an all ages book, would it have that same level of attention from the marketplace? So I, I think that these imprints, while all ages books are important, I feel like labeling these books all ages is very dangerous and could end up affecting the sales of some books that I think um, could have a wider audience. I would like to see all ages imprints that do cater mostly to children and the price of the books is lowered so that kids can afford them with their allowance. Just like we used to come into the comic book store as kids and buy books for 75 cents. You can't buy books for that much now. I don't understand how kids can get into the hobby outside of free comic book day or Halloween fest when they're paying four or $5 an issue, have these all ages imprints, lower the price on it. If you have to use that old style paper for it, that newsprint style paper that helps people get into the hobby. And then you're creating that customer to, that will then transition into those other titles as they read more. But no doubt, all ages and prints, they, they do have that uh, stigma. But speaking of stigma, the next one on the three down we're going to talk about is the villain stigma. We've always heard for a while now, oh, there's no use in collecting villains. They don't stay popular. The books don't stay up there. But if that's the case, we're not seeing that right now with a lot of current villains in comics, right? No, and I think that um, you can mirror one of our favorite things um, that we love to talk about, and that's pro wrestling, right? We grew up in the era where originally it was all, eat your vitamins and say your prayers. Uh, you know, it was all Hulk Hogan, uh, Macho Baby Man, face. right, Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior. Everything was the power of positivity, for, uh, to quote um, New Day, know, the New Day, uh, and Big E, who uh, does our awesome uh, channel uh, advertisement. But it's 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 one of those things where now you look at the fact that the the heroes that we cheer for tend to have that edge, right? You look at the characters like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, who talk junk and say bad words. And now the modern you're like rooting for a heel turn, <laughs> right? And the modern characters. Um, where we cheer when Roman Reigns turns bad. Um, we get excited when uh, Kenny Omega turns his back on his tag team partner. These are moments that we, that we root for. And it, I think that that translates to the way in which people look at movies, um, the way in which we're reading comics. Uh, the villain isn't just, it's here, and then when it's gone, we forget about it. Thanos is an, uh, is an example of a character who has had an impact on popular culture that I think will transcend the life of those movies. Those movies are, are gonna be timeless. And a lot of people were predicting the downfall of that book. And when I say a lot of people, I mean like really smart investors, really smart speculators, really smart collectors, people who have been doing this forever. But what there was think, the trend at the time. So you yeah, yeah, trend. it's all they had ever seen. And But we were entering a time period, and this is why I'm so bullish on the comic market is we're constantly entering new eras, right? Like we don't, how do you, Base anything. It's before. undisputed. Right. <laughs> I like what you did there. How do you base anything on what we did before when, like, we've never had a Disney Plus? Like, that's going to change everything. So, when the MCU came out, it just changed everything. And Thanos became so important. So many kids grew up watching that saga. Um, and it's funny how many people watched the, the extra credit scene in the Avengers and walked out of that theater going, Who was that guy? Oh, yeah. And then now they all know. Um, the amount of merchandise that was been sold with his face on. And, and you look at it now to, to bring it into where we're at in publishing now. Look at Punchline. Look at, um, uh, look at Null. These are characters who ascend very quickly. And there is no fear of, well, once we move beyond them in the comic, no one's going to want them. That, that has not proven to be the case. Um, you know, people still are buying Gore the God Butcher. 
because they're bullish on that character and they they're they're feverishly waiting for his return in some publishing story um we're about to hit an era of the movies where we're going to get like some of the classic villains we're going to probably see magneto and dr doom and galactus and i think villains are really repositioned to be as important as heroes or more important because we've talked about this before a lot of our heroes their first appearances are already so expensive you can't have a hero without a villain also you really can't and we've seen this before a hero works best when a villain is truly their match um, or outmatches them and causes them to have to bring in people like we saw with the Avengers of Thanos and all of that. So uh, it, it's really the key. And if you don't have that, and it's just like wrestling, if you don't have your dance partner, uh, you know, The Rock is nothing without having Stone Cold. And to be able to have that counterpart, um, that yin to yang, um, that's what makes that magic. So uh, at this point, I think this newer generation, this younger generation of comic collector, they would probably laugh, Brian, if we told them some of the, the thinking that just 10 years ago, you'd have, you'd have told a young, a young investor, like, no, don't put your money into the new villain character. That's stupid. Um, and my favorite book this week is Superman 25, spoiler alert, but uh, is that that first appearance of the new Superman villain? I think that would be my favorite book this week. Yeah, and that's not to say that every villain's going to be worth no. picking up. I mean, and like we always say, buy what you like. You might have a villain that speaks to you that you really uh, get attracted to and love reading about, and the rest of the market might not like it. Screw the rest of the market. It's your collection. You buy what you like. But either way, guys, there's a three up, three down this week. Let us know in the comments what do you guys think is hot, what do you think is cold. We just showed you what we thought. With that being said, this is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you in the next video. Yeah, no, I'm studying like a milli rocket. Skin clear, still look young, Andy Miller knockers. Money in my pocket. Don't call me a money pocket. Engine get to rocket. It sound like a thunder rocket. Yeah, I still love my baby even when it's toxic. Crazy like she Britney, but no, she don't shade the knock. No, Russell Wilson.